get this started here. All right, so this is going to be our last uh, last proper lecture of pathophysiology. I thought I would uh, record it because there are a lot of uh, a lot of nuanced things we're going to talk about. So this picture that I've drawn up here, this is a, this is kind of a big big picture look at, at what we're going to talk about today. And, and what I really want to talk about today is how interrelated things really are. We tend to we tend to take, and even in paramedic school, you're going to find, we tend to take kind of a systems approach. We'll say, okay, this is a cardiovascular system, this is the nervous system, and we tend to take kind of a systems approach, and we look at the, these things in different chunks, and it, sometimes it can be really difficult to make that transition from looking at a patient in chunks to, oh, these are all very inter highly interrelated, and you guys, of course, uh, I've heard you kind of making jokes about the, the kidneys and how kidney failure just pops up everywhere. I could be talking about uh, something seemingly unrelated to kidneys and, oh, they're the kidney failure. And, and, and so you, you're starting to see just how interrelated things can actually be. And so today um, we're going to talk primarily about shock, what shock is and shock states. But to really dive, take a deeper dive into it, um, I want to show you a little bit about how, when, when we have a shock state, what is actually going on when the cells are not able to produce <clears throat> adequate amounts of adenosine triphosphate you know, for, for whatever reason, right? What are some of these downstream effects on all of these other metabolic cycles? And this is just a selected few of them. This is, this is not by any means um, all of the major significant cycles. I, the idea it didn't include the urea cycle and, and many others, um, but I've included a few of them. And we will see here in a little bit how they're so interrelated. What happens is if one shuts down, or maybe there's a mutation of an enzyme that is critical to the functioning of one cycle, how that can impact all these other cycles. And remember when we talked about the first first day of lecture we talked about, right, you've got chemistry in the atoms and then atoms can form molecules and molecules can form macromolecules and macromolecules can form cells and cells can form tissues and so on and so forth. And so what we can see is we can start here with these metabolic pathways and we can begin to understand how the downstream effects of impacting a couple pathways will go to impact the cell function and then ultimately tissue function and organ, organ system and organism and so on. Um, so that's kind of the goal of, of today. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an individual look at many of these cycles and we're going to, we're going to take like a focused look at them and then after we've taken a focused look at them then I will kind of go back to this diagram I put up here and we'll take a, a bigger picture look at what's going on. So uh, with that in mind, let's just go ahead and pose the question, what is shock? Right? When we say that somebody is in shock, well, what's that all about? Put a question mark there. What is shock? Okay, so the perfect, yeah, right, the, the perfect definition of it, right, if, if, if you want to go to the textbook, is inadequate tissue perfusion, right? Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's where we can start at least. So it is a state of inadequate, inadequate tissue perfusion. And let's dig a little deeper into what that actually means. So... Shock is actually the result of inadequate tissue perfusion, right? Inadequate tissue perfusion is not so much a definition as it is the cause of shock. So shock is a process. Shock is something that the body does in response to inadequate tissue perfusion. Does, does that kind of make sense? And so the question I want to pose to you is, is shock abnormal? Let me ask the question, is shock abnormal? Should we even look at it as being abnormal? I'm saying no, 
not as far as the process. Okay, good. So I mean, it's the it's the natural reaction of the body to whatever circumstances good. or something that it's under. Good. So shock, we can say is a normal. It is a normal reaction to an abnormal state of inadequate tissue perfusion. I think that perhaps encapsulates what shock is a little better than saying it is inadequate tissue perfusion. Um, well, shock is actually the constellation of signs and symptoms and downstream metabolic effects that we see and we can detect and we can assess in response to inadequate tissue perfusion. Um, so I always try to, to focus in on, it's actually normal, right? It is normal for the human body to go into shock when there's a state of inadequate tissue perfusion and you'd want the body to go into shock, right? It would be very, very queer if you came on scene and somebody say they've lost a significant amount of blood and you're assessing that patient and they did not have the classic signs and symptoms of shock. That would be very weird, right? That would be a very queer presentation. You'd go, why is this patient not tachycardic? Why are they not cool, pale, and diaphoretic? Why do they not have those classic signs and symptoms? Something must be going on, right? Um, so, yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the, the various things that can cause shock. So what are some of the various things that can cause inadequate tissue <coughs> perfusion? Trauma. Okay. So trauma. So there are, or, or, or rather, um, we talk about major categories or classifications of shock. Like what are like the major? The Distributive, cardiogenic. Um, so we've got... So let's talk, well, let's talk about the easiest one. Like what would probably be the easiest one to, to think about, concept, to conceptualize? Hypovolemic, you guys okay with that? And then, we, then we'll kind of work our way. So we've got hypovolemic, and what is hypovolemic? Good, it's, it's any condition that causes a state of low intravascular volume. Low vascular volume. So this is an actual loss of volume from the body, right? From the, from the vascular compartment, right? And so what kinds of things would be responsible for hypovolemic shock, if you had to guess? Okay, um, not trauma, yeah, hemorrhage. Yeah, good, hemorrhage. Okay, what else? Dehydration. How, how could you dehydrate? Be some pathophysiological processes in it. Burns. Yeah, burns. Okay. How? Like. So I get hemorrhage because that's you're bleeding out, right? But how? Uh, what are some other ways you can lose volume? Okay, so decreased intake, right? Decreased Just intake. simply having a decreased fluid intake. All right. Okay, fair enough. What else? Don't, it, it, maybe you're making it a little too hard. I'm, I'm just thinking, like, what, what are some ways that volume gets out of your body? Well, excessive or, huh? excessive excretion or excessive urination. Okay, so polyuria. Yeah. Okay. Polyuria. Diarrhea. Diuresis. Diarrhea. Excellent. What else? Vomiting. Vomiting is a good one. Good. Someone had mentioned burns. How, what's going on there with burns, though? Like, how are we losing fluid to burns? 
fluid shifts. Yeah, loss of cell integrity, and you have fluid, fluid leak. And fluid is actually leaking out of damaged cells and leaving the body. Okay, good. All right, so that's, that's hypovolemic, and what are the classic signs and symptoms of hypovolemic shock? So what do we see early on, we should say? Increased heart rate, increased respiratory. Okay. What are the earliest? Earliest. What's the earliest thing that we see? It's What's that? The earliest things we are going to see in hypovolemic shock are going to be mental status changes. Typically anxiety is what we see. So we see altered level of consciousness, right? In some 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 form. It can be just even simple anxiety. Then the middle signs and symptoms, so early, very, very early on, we see the anxiety, we see some mental status changes, right? Midway through, so to speak, this is where we see the classic signs and symptoms of shock. We see tachycardia. We see increased respiratory rate, and then we see diaphoresis with pallor. Okay, so those are kind of the classic. And then what are the, what's what's the late thing? What happens late into hypovolemic shock? Hypotension. Huh? Hypotension. Good. Hypotension. So hypotension is actually a, a very late finding. Right? Initially. Initially, you're going to be normotensive or maybe even hypertensive, potentially. Right? And you, did you guys, when you guys uh, were intermediates, did you learn the classes of hemorrhagic shock? As far as like compensatory? Like class one, class two, class three, and class four. Did you learn that? Probably, maybe, maybe. So um, what I want you to do is I want you to look this up. There's a little table. talk about the classes of hemorrhagic shock. So class one tends to be less than 750 milliliters of, of total blood loss. And then there are signs and symptoms associated with that. Class two is about 750 milliliters uh, to, I believe it's about 1.5 liters. You got it there? Class uh, 3 is going to be 1.5 to 1.5 to 2. Good. So 1.5 liters to two liters, and then class four is gonna be two liters and up. All right, so class one is early. You can look at this as early shock, and this is primarily where you're just gonna get some altered mental status, some subtle changes in the mental status. Class two, so greater than 750, but less than 1.5 liters, this is where we see the classic signs and symptoms, the tachycardia, the diaphoresis, the pallor, all right? And we don't actually have a lower blood pressure. Hypotension doesn't actually develop until we are in class, what we call class three hemorrhage, right? And this is where we see hypotension develop. And then class four hemorrhage, greater than about 40% blood loss, or greater than about two liters in the average generic adult 70 kilogram male, <laughs> is going to be circulatory collapse. You guys okay with that? With the classes? That kind of makes sense. Okay, cool. Um, another thing that happens that is common in hypovolemic shock is, first of all, why do people in hypovolemic shock tend to get pale and diaphoretic? <clears throat> What's the mechanism there? Sure. Why though? Why do they get pale? Why? What causes them to get pale and diaphoretic? 
Now, you could get pale from just losing blood, right? That is possible. But there are some other other mechanisms. Is the respiratory rate? No. Well, I mean, so with shunting, right, the, the capillaries of the skin no longer receiving blood flow. But why? Because it's trying to preserve life from them. But how is that happening? This is a pathophysiology cause. You're talking about like basal Yeah, what's, but how's that happening? What's causing that to happen? So the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system is definitely activated in, in hypovolemic shock, but there's actually a, a, a rapid kind of response that's occurring. Sympathetic. sympathetic. Yeah. So this is a sympathetic response primarily, right? And what do we see with this sympathetic response? We see tachycardia, increased respiratory rate, increased depth of respiration, we see howler, we see diaphoresis, right, in a, right, a sympathetic response. You guys, you guys okay with that? That, that kind of makes sense. That's why you have vasoconstriction. That's why you get shunting of blood away from your periphery, right? That happens in a sympathetic response, right? That's why some of you, when you take your exam tomorrow, you're gonna feel your heart going like this, your hands are gonna get kind of sweaty and you might even get a little pale because it's the same response, right? Have you, you guys ever had to give somebody epinephrine, say for anaphylaxis or a status asthmaticus or a you know, really bad COPD exacerbation? Have you ever had to do that? Are those patients comfortable after they get the epinephrine? No, many of them feel like they're gonna die, right? Have you ever had that experience? You give them epinephrine, and they feel like this sense of impending doom, and they get pale and diaphoretic, right? Because what have you done? You have essentially given them a big dose of sympathetic nervous system. Um, and so that, that's common, right? It's, it, that can commonly happen. That's a common <coughs> side effect um, of, of giving someone epinephrine. Okay. Uh, so there are some things that I want to focus on just a little bit that also happen as a result of that sympathetic response. And these are things that involve the capillary beds. All right, so you've got your capillary beds. All right. So I'm going to draw the capillary beds the best I can, or we'll, we'll simplify that a little bit. Okay. So here we have an arteriole, and here we have a venule, and in between them we have the capillary beds. So blood is flowing into the capillary beds via the arterioles and out of the capillary beds via the venules. You guys okay with that? And there is smooth muscle, there are wraps of smooth muscle. So you've got smooth muscle that wraps around the arterioles and you've got smooth muscles that wrap around the venules. These are called sphincters, all right? The mus smooth muscle that wraps around the arterial is known as the precapillary sphincter, and then the smooth muscle that wraps around the venule is known as the postcapillary sphincter, all right? And so what happens in your classic shock state when you have epinephrine and norepinephrine that gets released in your bloodstream, it circulates to these. And the first thing that happens is the postcapillary sphincters get activated. You guys okay with that? The postcapillary sphincters get activated and they squeeze down. Does that make sense? They squeeze down. So the venous system squeezes down, right? And that creates some pressure, right? And so that's going to create some pressure that's going to start shunting blood in this direction back into the arterial system, right? You guys okay with that? Does that, does that kind of make sense? So step one, post-capillary sphincters squeeze. Now that can do something unique to the patient's blood pressure. Okay, so is this, uh, so this is primarily impacting the arterial system, right? So you're getting some back pressure on the arterial system. So what can happen with these patients is their diastolic pressure 
Because remember, diastole is primarily what? Well, when the left ventricle is relaxing, right? It's the pressure at rest, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's essentially the the <laughs> pressure within the arterial system, right? That the heart is kind of over. That it's, it's in some sense an indi indication of afterload, right? What the heart is in systole, what it is pushing against. So what can happen here? when these post-capillary sphincters constrict is they can cause an increase in the di diastolic pressure. So the diastolic blood pressure has a tendency to increase in people with shock, right? And in fact, diastole, or the diastolic blood pressure is often an indication, it is often a mirror of what might be going on with the sympathetic nervous system. And so what can happen is, as you go further and further into your shock state, what happens? You start losing volume, and what happens to systole, the pressure that the left ventricle is pumping blood out, right? It's going to decrease. Diastole may not, the diastolic may not decrease as much. Is that what they're talking about, the narrowing? So you're going to have a narrowing of what's known as the pulse pressure. Right, the difference between systole and diastole, right? And that is also another finding that we see in shock states, right? And that's due to this mechanism. Does that kind of make sense? Why we might see that narrowing of the pulse pressure. And, and the systole and diastole <coughs> become, come closer and closer and closer together. Um, now, hypovolemic shock isn't the only cause of that narrowing pressure. There are many other things that, that can do it as well. Tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade um, as well. Okay, then what happens is as we progress into that shock state, the precapillary sphincter, sphincter then closes off as well. So postcapillary and then precapillary, right, as we progress through that shock state. And then as we progress even further into that shock state and the body loses the ability to really compensate, what happens is both of these sphincters just kind of poop out, so to speak. They're just like, we can't do this anymore, and they both open up. And what can happen is all this blood that kind of got caught in the capillary space that wasn't really moving around, that's hypoxic, that's acidotic, that has lots of of cellular waste products that have built up into it, well, what happens? Well, that stuff then gets washed out into this, the central circulation, right? Um, and so now we have all, all these wastes, these acidic uh, byproducts of anaerobic metabolism, um, et cetera, um, going into the central circulation in the later stages of shock. Um, and obviously that can compound the situation pretty, pretty substantially, right? You're going to see the patients tend to become much more acidotic at this point, right? Because you've got a lot of lactic acid that's getting flushed out in there. Um, they can have like uh, lots of potassium ions that built up in there. And so you can have electrolyte imbalances and so on. Um, so hopefully that explains why or what's going on there. You guys okay? You okay with that? Okay, excellent. Okay, so that's hypovolemic shock. Uh, I think somebody had mentioned distributive shock earlier, and that is, in fact, another major category of shock. And what is that? What's going on with distributive shock? There are subclasses, but like, what's the uh, right the high yield? So hypovolemic is simply low vascular volume with all this nuance. What's the what's going on with distributive? It could be like spinal shock. But what's going on there? Like, <clears throat> yeah. Well, that can happen with hypovolemic as well. But like, what's going on? I mean, it's. It's, it's still a sh shock due to loss of volume, but it's distributed, it's the way it's distributed through the body. Well, are you losing volume? In, in some places, maybe. Are, are we losing volume from the, the body, though, I should say? It's not, le volume's not leaving the body, it's not right? Leaving the body. 
what's so going it's on. Like a, it's like fluid, fluid is being shifted into other areas potentially. It's being redistributed, right? So that fluid is not in the vascular space or the vascular space itself has what? Has become larger. The container has become larger. And did they, did they, when they talked about perfusion, or when you guys were taught about perfusion, where you taught about kind of the three major things that form perfusion, you've got the pump, you've got the pipes, <coughs> and you've got the fluid, right? Does that make sense? And were you guys kind of taught that analogy? Probably. It's a fairly common analogy. Uh, common analogy. So with hypovolemic shock, that's more of a fluid problem, right? You're losing fluid. All right, so that's a hypovolemic problem. Well, distributive shock tends to be more of a pipe problem. or the container, some people want to call it the container slash pipes, right? So the pipes become larger, right? You have the same amount of fluid, but now you have to circulate that fluid through a much larger container, right? And that can't occur as effectively. Um, so it is a distribution pipe problem, we'll say. I'll just put quotes around that. All right, so what are some uh, types of distributive shock that you guys can think of? Septic. Septic shock is a big one, right? Good, what else? Anaphylaxis. Hmm? Anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis, that's kind of a classic, <coughs> classic one that we talk about even though we run into septic a lot more. Okay, what else? Okay, neurogenic and oh, spinal. Cardiogenic no. Spinal? Spinal, yeah. Some people talk about neurogenic and spinal together. That's right. I'm confused. But, but neurogenic tends to be more of a, um, a brain, right? A, a brain problem, whereas spinal is an actual disconnection of the, sym the sympathetic nervous system, right? The sympathetic nervous system comes out of your <coughs> thoracic and lumbar spine. And so if you disconnect the sympathetic nervous system, um, that tends to cause the spinal. So with, whereas, whereas neuro, neurogenic um, is, it can be more of a, of a brain issue. Could be like, like ICP build up in the brain. Could be, yeah, yeah, brain injury, and you have autonomic instability that occurs as a result of that. Um, and then the last one is what we call vasovagal, vasovagal syncope or near syncope, right? And this is that classic fainting, right? Right, so something happens to somebody and it elicits a, va a vagal, right? The vagus nerve gets activated and that dumps a bunch of acetylcholine right and that causes a lot of vasodilation to occur and what happens you feel faint maybe even pass out <laughs> and you fall to the ground and then when you fall to the ground your blood pressure increases and you tend to wake up right you guys okay with that all right so in all cases this really is these really are a vasodilatory kind of problem right vasodilation tends to be the problem with these now, these can have different presentations, right? So these might not necessarily present with the classic signs and symptoms of shock, particularly neurogenic and spinal shock, and sometimes even vasovagal syncope. Will they necessarily present with tachycardia? They may present with bradycardia. Um, in the case of neurogenic and spinal shock, spinal shock in particular, Will the patients necessarily be pale and diaphoretic? They might not even be pale and diaphoretic. If you cut the sympathetic <coughs> nervous system off, right, wherever that deficit is, 
right below that deficit, they may actually be That's, pink and dry. Is that um, Cushing's? Triad? Cushing's triad is a is is a, a, a tri a, a three a triad of, of findings that suggest a herniation. Bradycardia is part of Cushing's triad, but then you've got two other components, respiratory changes and um, so on, right? So your classic spinal shock patient, right? If they have a high spine injury where you cut the sympathetic nervous system off, right? Be below the level of that injury, you may see, you may see a patient pale and diaphoretic above the injury and then below the injury, um, that diaphoresis and pallor may actually go away. Does that, that kind of make sense? Um, some of these patients may be very warm, right? If they're septic, for example, right? Septic shock patient may present warm, right? They may not be cool, clammy, diaphoretic. Um, they can be, particularly in the later, right? In the later stages of septic shock, as they begin to decompensate, um, and some people even say septic shock can have different phases. You've got your warm phase, or we call it your hyperdynamic phase, and then your cool phase, and your, your, your hypodynamic phase. So distributive shock can have some different manifestations, but we treat it typically like a um, pipe problem, um, which means that, yes, we can look at giving some fluids. Right? We may need to give some fluids, but another important part of treating distributive shock is to do what? Is to constrict, is to make the container smaller, right? So medications that can do that, that can impact those pipes, right? So alpha, your alpha agonists are gonna be important. So medications such as, huh? Levofed or norepinephrine, yeah. Epinephrine can do the job as well, but norepinephrine is often kind of a go-to agent, say, for septic shock. For anaphylaxis, epinephrine tends to be our go-to um, agent. Uh, for neurogenic and spinal shock, um, very cautious use of things like norepinephrine um, may be our go-to, and then obviously vasovagal tends to be self-limiting for the most part. Okay, you guys good with that, with distributive shock? All right, what's the next major category, shock? Well, mm, cardiogenic belongs to this category. Obstructive. Good, obstructive. So anything that obstructs, right? That obstructs the flow of blood, right? And so these are primarily gonna be pump related, right? Obstructive shock. Obstructive shock is primarily gonna impact the pump, right? So this obstructs blood flow, all right, so what are some examples of that? Someone already mentioned cardiogenic, right, heart acutely fails, what else? What are some other ways that I can obstruct or impact flow out of the heart to the rest of the body? <clears throat> hmm? Tamponade, yeah, tamponade, absolutely, yeah. Pericardial tamponade. The pericardial uh, compartment fills up with blood or some other fluid, and that right compresses the heart. The heart's not able to pump blood out effectively. Absolutely. Anything else? Attention pneumothorax. Absolutely. <coughs> Attention pneumothorax can absolutely do that, right? particularly on the right side of the heart, right? It can impact um, preload to the right side of the heart. And just large clots, right? 
embolize and thrombi, right? Like a massive pulmonary embolism could do it, right? And throw a massive PE back in, something like that could do it. Okay, good. Um, now, more or less, this is probably what you guys have learned, right? Prior, this should, hopefully it's nothing new. Um, I do want to add another one in there because I want us to broaden our definition of what shock is, right? It is the result of inadequate tissue perfusion. And there's another thing that can cause us that we often don't think about. And I call this histotoxic. Right, so hist histology is tissue. So there's some toxicity that prevents perfusion, right? So this is the result of some sort of toxic exposure, right? That prevents adequate tissue perfusion. So could you guys think of some, some toxic exposure situations that could also result in shock? Uh, okay. Um, yeah, organo, organic phosphorus agents are, uh, can do that. They're not commonly encountered here in the U.S. They can do that in some roundabout <coughs> ways, right? They can. Mm, you guys are, yeah. I, I want to think of some. Think, think of some more commonly encountered situations. Carbon monoxide. carbon monoxide would be like a classic, right? Yeah, a classic thing, right? Yeah, carbon monoxide toxicity, right? Because this is directly toxic to the to the red blood cells or to the hemoglobin, right? What other toxicities are gonna really cyanide? different cyanide forms if it's not not very very common but but certainly it can do it anything else you can think of venom huh venom mm. what about just like the typical overdose of like opiates overdose okay yeah if you become hypoxic that can if you become hypoxic that could cause right your heart to not function as well Right, that could cause you to dilate out a little bit. So there's some downstream, but maybe not <coughs> right, maybe not directly toxic. Um, what about met hemoglobinemia? You remember talking about that? Right, met hemoglobinemia. Right, where the hemoglobin gets turned from its plus two state into its plus three state, the iron and it can no longer bind to oxygen. So if somebody gets exposed to a, like a local anesthetic, like let's say you're in the ER and you're helping uh, do a procedure on somebody and they use um, some, some benzocaine spray, right? Spray the, maybe they have an abscess, like a peritonsal or abscess or something like that, and they spray the back of their throat with some benzocaine to numb them up so they can, they can go in and, and, and do a drainage of that abscess. And then that benzocaine gets absorbed and it causes met hemoglobinemia to occur in that patient, right? Um, that's, that would be kind of a classic way that that can happen. And, and it's, pretty, it's pretty nasty when it does, you know. And, um, um, it'd be really cool if you were the medic helping out on that procedure and that patient's starting to get anxious and their heart rate's going up and their, their saturations are going down. That'd be really, really cool for you to go, oh, this is as benzocaine spray. This is met hemoglobinemia. Let's get the methylene blue on board now. Okay, cool. All right. So there we go. Uh, are you guys good with that? Does that, that kind of make sense? Okay, so now that we understand shock at a big, so this is kind of a big picture, right? Kind of looking at the organism side of the house and some of the, the big picture signs and symptoms. Let's now go to the other side of the house and let's talk about what is going on at a cellular and subcellular level in a shock state. And so to understand that, we have to understand how our cells produce energy. And how do cells produce energy? Or first of all, what is the primary fuel, the primary energy currency uh, within our cells?
adenosine triphosphate, right? High energy phosphate molecules, ATP. So the question is, how do our cells make ATP? Let me ask you, how do they make ATP? There's a few ways, right? What's that? There's a few ways, like the first two parts. It's like from glucose, and then the first one gives you a little bit of ATP to fuel the next whole cycle. Okay, so there's some cycles involved, definitely, yeah. So what we're going to start off if we're going to start off talking about the classic thing that you should have learned <coughs> in anatomy. So the classic way that we talk about energy production is you've got glucose. You've got glucose circulating in your bloodstream, right? And then that glucose can get into the cells, right? Now in most cells, glucose can't freely pass through the cell membrane, right? Because it's a semi-permeable, it's selective. So there is, a, there is a channel that allows the glucose to enter, but what needs to happen to activate that channel, to open that channel? Insulin. Right, insulin actually attaches to a receptor on the cell, and then there are some, there is a, a signaling cascade, um, and then that signaling cascade causes that glucose channel to open up and then glucose can enter and that's something known as facilitated diffusion. If you remember back at the beginning of pathophysiology, we talked about right osmosis, diffusion, active transport, facilitated diffusion, etc. That would be a good example, facilitated diffusion. Okay, so glucose enters the cell and when glucose enters the cell, it goes through a cycle, a process known as glycolysis, right? And in glycolysis, a very small amount of ATP is produced, uh, not enough to effectively run the cell in most cases, in most cells. Uh, there are some cells that only need glycolysis, and those are the red blood cells. But the red blood cells don't do anything, right? They don't even have a nucleus. Red blood cell doesn't even have a nucleus, doesn't make its own proteins. Right? So it's not doing complex metabolic processes. It floats around in your bloodstream and the hemoglobin transports oxygen. Um, that's kind of what red blood cells do. Um, so they don't need anything beyond glycolysis. However, any of your other cells that actually are involved in heavy metabolic workloads, glycolysis isn't going to cut it. You guys okay with that? And so what happens is glucose comes into glycolysis and pyruvate or pyruvic acid is what comes out, right? Now there's all these little interconnected things we'll talk about in just a little bit. All right, so glucose comes in, pyruvate comes out. You guys good with that? Now, as long as the cell's functioning normally, what's gonna happen is that pyruvate, for the most part, is gonna go into another cycle. And that cycle is going to occur within the mitochondria of the cell. You guys know what the mitochondria are, right? The mitochondria are a very important organelle within the cell. These are sometimes referred to as, referred to as the powerhouse of the cell, right? And there are two very important cycles that occur within the mitochondria. And the first of which is something known as the Krebs cycle, or some people will call this the tricarboxylic acid cycle, or the citric acid cycle. We'll stick with Krebs for the sake of simplicity. So pyruvate comes into the Krebs cycle, and there are a couple things that happens in the Krebs cycle. The first thing is carbon dioxide comes out as a waste, right? Because essentially, what is what is a glucose? Glucose is <coughs> six carbons, right? You've got a polymer of six carbons, a chain of six carbons, and then hydrogens and oxygens attached to that. Does that make sense? Right? And pyruvate is, is, is a modified glucose molecule, but you still have that six carbon chain. And, and here in a few minutes, I'm gonna actually pull up diagrams that are gonna diagram each of these cycles in all their gory little steps, right? Um, but this is a bigger picture look at that right now. All right, 
So the pyruvate comes in and we start tearing the hydrogens off of that carbon chain. Does that make sense? The hydrogens start getting tore off. And so what you're left with is oxygen and carbon, right? And that forms the carbon dioxide waste that comes out of the Krebs cycle. You guys okay with that? So that's where all the CO2, remember we talked about CO2 transport and how its importance in acid-base balance. That's where all the CO2 is coming from, is the Krebs cycle. Okay, so what happens is those hydrogens that get tore off, those hydrogens get attached to special transport molecules. And these transport molecules are what are known as coenzymes. And so in some cases, for an enzyme to function properly, another molecule needs to come and modify that enzyme in some way to help it function properly. And that other molecule is known as a coenzyme. And so two of the most important coenzymes are NAD plus and FAD. And so NAD plus and FAD come in, they pick up those hydrogens and they become NADH and FADH2. You guys okay with that? So they pick up the hydrogens and obviously the electrons associated with the hydrogen and then they shuttle those to another cycle known as the electron transport cycle. And again, this is the second major cycle that is, that, that is occurring within the mitochondria. You, got, you okay with that? And what happens is in the electron transport cycle, the hydrogens get deposited kind of in a reservoir, if you will, right? They get deposited in a reservoir. And so you have this big reservoir of, of hydrogens, hydrogen ions, more appropriately. And then what happens is that electron comes in and the electron has some energy associated with it, right? And what happens is that electron kind of gets handed off to different proteins. And as it gets handed off to one protein and another and another, the, the, the energy of the electron decreases. So it's giving up some of its energy to power those proteins. They're not known as cytochrome proteins, right? And ultimately what happens during electron transport is the electron is transported down those proteins and the hydrogen ion gradient that's created is used to produce large amounts of ATP. You guys okay with that? Right? Now what happens is you've got a lot of hydrogen ions and electrons that start piling up as waste. Right? They get used. Once they're used, you have them as waste and something needs to come in and eliminate that waste. Right? That's, or it'll be a problem. And the thing that comes in is oxygen. So oxygen comes in, right, and oxygen can chemically bind with the hydrogens and the electrons to form water molecules. Does that make sense? So once those electrons and hydrogen ions are used to produce ATP, so ADP, adenosine diphosphate, is transformed into ATP, adenosine triphosphate, in the electron transport chain. Um, and then the leftover stuff gets attached to oxygen to produce water. So CO2 comes out of the Krebs cycle as a waste and H2O or water comes out of electron transport as a quote unquote waste. You guys, you guys okay with that there? Okay, and then you make <coughs> lots and lots of adenosine triphosphate. You guys good with that? Okay, so it's glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport. This is the classic way that we make energy, right? This, Hopefully what you guys were taught when you took anatomy and physiology or something very similar to that, right? That's a classic way we make energy. So let's now talk about what happens in a shock state. So in a shock state, what happens? I develop inadequate tissue perfusion, right? Which means what? These cells are not what? They're not being perfused. They're not getting oxygen, right? They're not getting adequate amounts of oxygen. So what's gonna happen to electron transport if it's not getting enough oxygen? It turns off, it quits working, right? <coughs> it quits working, which means the NADH, FADH piles up, right? And it backs up into the Krebs cycle. And what happens to the Krebs cycle? 
It just it quits working, right? It doesn't work effectively, right? So essentially, electron transport in Krebs just kind of grind to a halt, so to speak, right? And they quit working, and what happens to all the large amounts of ATP that's being produced? Stops, right? You have no production of ATP down here. And you can look at this as what we call aerobic respiration within the mitochondria, and glycolysis outside the mitochondria. Well, let me ask you a question. Does glycolysis need oxygen to work? No, glycolysis is completely anaerobic. It is what we call anaerobic respiration, right? So when the electron transport shuts down, the only way the cell can make energy, ATP, is through glycolysis, and it's a very small amount, right? And so this is what we call anaerobic respiration, right? And so what happens is this shuts down, right? The cells cannot make ATP or enough ATP, and glycolysis is the only substantial cycle working. Well, what happens here in glycolysis is it continues to make pyruvate, right? Because it doesn't need oxygen to make pyruvate. But here's a question. Does the pyruvate go into the Krebs cycle? No, it can't go into the Krebs cycle, right? Because this is all shut down. So what happens is pyruvate gets converted to excess amounts of pyruvate gets converted into lactic acid. And of course, lactic acid becomes lactate when it does what acids do, right? <coughs> now, in a normally functioning cell, a cell that's functioning normally, if you make lactate, well, that lactate gets sent over to the liver. And there's something called the quarry cycle in the liver, okay? Right, and so in the day-to-day -day operation of the cell, right, excess pyruvate gets converted to lactic acid, but that lactic acid or that lactate goes over to the liver, it goes into the Cori cycle, and the Cori cycle takes lactate and converts it back into glucose. And then that glucose is then dumped back into glycolysis. Does that make sense? Right, that's a normally functioning cell. The Cori cycle takes energy, it takes ATP. Well, what in a shock state is the cell not making? It's not making ATP, so that lactate, is it going to get fed into the Cori cycle and through gluconeogenesis, or the new production of glucose, get converted back to glucose? No, not in the shocked cell, right? So what's gonna happen instead? A buildup of lactic acid, right? So. It's, so, so two things are happening. The cell does not have enough energy to run its metabolic processes. It's becoming acidotic, right? Massive amounts of lactic acid are being produced because I have too much pyruvate, right, being produced, and the pyruvate gets converted to lactate, right? So the cell is becoming acidotic. It can't run its, its processes. And then another thing that happens is well, what, per, what, what balances the water moving in and out of the cells? <clears throat> like what keeps the water in ion gradients acceptable? Sodium. The sodium-potassium pump, right? You guys remember learning about the sodium-potassium pump? Well, that sodium-potassium pump needs energy, right? Well, it's not getting energy. So the sodium potassium pumps begin to fail and sodium begins rushing into the cell, pulling water into the cell. And so now this shocked cell begins to what? Begins to swell and it begins to start to rupture, right? And this is how cells die in a shocked state, right? At least at the big picture. Does that, does that make sense? You guys okay with that there? Awesome, awesome. All right, where are we at time-wise? Uh, almost an hour. How about we take a break?